tech and investment. He currently heads up the startup engagement and investments at ICICI Bank, where he played an instrumental role in setting up the innovation team and executing the cutting edge technology led projects in collaboration with fintech startup. That's not all, he also leads the fintech investment funds for investing in emerging fintech startups and actively mentoring many growing startup domains like artificial intelligence, open banking, blockchain, and many more. He is also responsible for India's first blockchain-based banking consortium, the blockchain infrastructure company, bringing together 15 private PSU and foreign banks as founding members and equity holders. Prior to this, he also led the investment banking vertical focused on mid-market and agriculture business group and executed multiple M&A and private equity transaction. Ladies and gentlemen, now I shall request Mr. Hitesh Sajdev to please be on stage to start the session of Blockchain in Finance, The Breakthrough. Uh, it's an immense pleasure to be, you know, presenting some of the use cases on DLT to all of you. Uh, I'm Hitesh Sajdev and I manage a startup you know, investments and engagements at ICISA Bank. Uh, sorry, just one second. Yeah. So if we see, you know, banking, how it has evolved over a period of so many years, right? I mean, it started with a branch-centric model where everything was built around branch, where everything was built around branch. And now we are moving towards a customer-centric model. So, entire set of, like first innovation, which was like ATM, right? Uh, you know, a few years back, you know, uh, kind of, it, 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 it bring in, you know, brought in an era where people could withdraw cash, you know, it was not limited to the branch hours, you know, you can do actually uh, limited banking through ATM, you know, beyond, you know, uh, banking hours also. And then came, you know, the internet banking, which gave the comfort to people to do banking, sitting out of their home anytime, anywhere. What next, you know? How do we democratize the financial services, right? As a bank, what we do, we take deposits and we do lending. That's the core function of a bank. Where bank is managing your finances, it, it is acting as an intermediary in between, right? So, how do one brings in, you know, more uh, a trust, more transparency, more uh, efficiency in terms of, you know, doing the, uh, you know, various, you know, kind of aspects of, you know, banking, right? And that's where DLT or blockchain probably would, uh, you know, usher in the new era of innovation. So, you know, DLT, brings in a layer of trust. When there are, you know, multiple parties involved, uh, you know, you need to know what is the source of truth. You know, a single kind of source of truth, a layer of trust, and impeccable transparency. It also allows you to, you know, bring in audit trail to the last mile transactions. And as we move forward, we will kind of, you know, discuss some of the use cases where DLT has been aptly used, you know, in, in, in specifically in the banking domain. Uh, so let me talk about the first use case, you know, which is trade finance. Now, as we all know, trade finance is very cumbersome, paper intensive. It is, you know, prone to frauds is it involves multiple parties, right? To consume it, a single trade transaction, you need a buyer, seller, uh, you know, a buyer's bank, seller's bank, insurance company, uh, freight forwarding agent, shipping line, you know, all those form, all those are important stakeholders when it comes to, cons to, con to consume a trade transaction. So typically, you know, all these stakeholders, 
they are on different platforms and they operate very differently. So what we have done is we have tried to create a consortium of banks, which is, you know, IBBIC, Indian Bank Blockchain Infra Company, and we have 18 banks which are founding members in this consortium. We all have come together to create a trade finance ecosystem, which is a self-fulfilling ecosystem for trade. In this platform, we have brought in all the banks. We are trying to onboard, you know, the buyers, sellers, exporters, importers, shipping companies, insurance companies, you know, freight forwarders, all of them on one single platform. So typically, let's take an example of a, let's say letter of credit, right? Today, if you want to open a letter of credit, you know, you give an application, let's say if I am a buyer in Ahmedabad and seller is in, let's say Delhi, we don't know each other to provide the trust, you know, bank comes in between by providing letter of credit. So buyer approaches the buyer's bank, you know, and gives an application for issuing the letter of credit to the seller's bank, which will advise the seller that, hey, we have got the letter of credit and now you can actually, you know, transport the goods. And then transportation documents are kind of, you know, uh, exchanged between the banks. So if you typically, you know, examine the entire transaction right from the opening of LC till the time, you know, you discount it and bills under LC and all those stuff, it takes anywhere between eight to 10 days, you know. How do we bring all the stakeholders on this single platform where the information is available real time to all the stakeholders and there is a intermediary like IBBIC which is a trust provider. In some of the use cases you may find that we may not need an advising bank also because you know the buyer seller everybody is on the same platform is there a need for an advising bank. Actually, issuing bank can directly, you know, advise an LC to the seller. So, this can bring down the time taken of, you know, right from issuance to the discounting of 8 to 10 days to, you know, less than 2 days. And the way we have built the entire infrastructure is the front-end, you know, application uh, the nodes are available to all the banks and we have created a layer of DLT on the backend database, you know, which is provided by R3 Coda. It provides end to end, you know, audit trail of all the transactions on the platform and all the nodes on the platform, they get, and then obviously with the privilege rights, you know, it's a private consensus based, you know, DLT, uh, you know, framework. So all the, all the nodes on the platform, they get to see, you know, what they need to see, right? So this is one of the, you know, initial use case, which, you know, which is taken off. And we believe that, you know, uh, this can actually bring in the entire turnaround time for LC issuance and LC, you know, discounting. Couple of the other use cases are, you know, again, if we see till 2014, 84% of the transactions were, you know, open account transactions. And 2018-19, it went up to 88%. So what does it mean that, you know, customers are actually moving away from the bank for their trade requirement. So obviously one of the reason is the cost involved. But the other reasons are that, you know, there is a lot of efficiency issues, you know, people are wanting to do a trade and they want to avail the LCs, BGs immediately, you know. Some are, sometimes the turnaround times are so high that, you know, customers lose on business opportunities, right? So this will somehow solve some of those problems. And, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned, you know, there are various benefits, right? You, you're able to digitize the entire trade, right? And many times we have been since last so many 
years we have been asking documents without even knowing the reason why we are asking those documents right so for example let's say purchase order po now what is the significance of po why po is required why proforma invoice is required can it be created on the same platform you know where buyer and seller can initiate the transaction on the platform itself you need not ask for additional documents you know from the customer so it's not about only converting you know the paper process to digital process but it's also about reimagining the entire trade finance right that's what we are trying to do it here and attempting to do it you know uh, one of the most uh, apt use case you know uh, for all the banks the another you know uh, use case for dlt is tokenization uh let me give an example if i am a supplier to a large corporate okay and let's say that corporate is triple a rated or double a rated if i raise a bill on that corporate you know any bank will discount that bill for me now assuming that i have done nothing i have just bought the goods from a tier 2 vendor and i have supplied it to the corporate will the tier 2 vendor who is supplier to me will get the same kind of response or you know credibility when he goes to bank to discount my you know bill accepted by me answer is no right how do we kind of you know use dlt you know in this kind of use cases where we can actually fractionalize the invoice so if i am raising an invoice on a corporate let's say a 1000 rupee invoice a corporate can actually give me 1000 tokens so it's not one invoice of 1000 rupees it's a 1000 tokens which they have accepted and i can distribute those tokens to my suppliers okay and those tokens are issued by a large corporates they can actually tier 2 tier the suppliers can actually take those tokens go to the bank or a liquidity provider and encash it you know so it can solve that problem of tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 suppliers where you know tokenization can fulfill that last mile gap of msme financing other use case like uh, you know sebi has recently come out with a discussion paper they're asking for the feedback you know from all the stakeholders about fractional ownership you know fractional ownership of let's say properties today if we want to buy a property amongst you know 10 20 or 100 of us you know and own a single property and take the benefit of the rental or anything out of that property there are models like rit and all those kind of models right but can we kind of and that's on a larger scale right how do i bring bring it to a micro scale or micro level transactions so you know again through tokenization one can digitize the entire asset and the tokens can be distributed to the participants you know and you can actually do the fractional ownership of the asset and this applies to commodities this can apply to you know properties you know anything tokenization is also used big time in terms of you know reducing your fraud and security and, 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 and enhancing your security you know so again a big big use case of dlt you know syndicated loans is you know kind of uh, uh, an area where multiple banks you know come and form a consortium and you know give a large and take a large exposure on a single borrower so the way it works is that you know lead bank does the assessment lead banks you know they uh, do the credit appraisal and then they kind of invite the member banks to take you know a portion of the exposure which the lead bank has you know done the assessment for the borrower now if you see this process it is done in a very traditional fashion where a lot of documents are exchanged you know and once the loan is disbursed after the disbursement the entire monitoring monitoring of the loan account is also done like you know in a very traditional fashion where lead bank gets all the data and then they exchange 
rather than that if we kind of you know create you know a platform through dlt where we bring all the consortium members together and you know a single kind of an appraisal you know a format which is available on the platform which every bank can use it and decide what exposure they want to take and after taking the exposure they can also look at the monitoring reports you know what kind of uh, what is the health of the borrower all those can be kind of you know done independently without you know depend without creating any dependence on the lead bank it brings more transparency more efficiency in managing the you know loans through consortium cbdc i think uh, all of you are familiar with uh, stable coins anybody who is not familiar probably i think i am i'm sure all of you would have heard about usdc usdt you know all stable coins right i mean so cbdc is a format where you know central bank digital currency is a format where you know think of it let like you can program your money so let's say if i want to give my kid a 1000 rupee and i want that he should buy books out of those 1000 rupees you know how do i ensure that he buys the books only he can go with that 1000 rupee to any shop and buy chocolates or whatever he wants to buy right i have no control can i program my money that this money is valid only for buying books can i do that that is what you know dlt can do for us where you can program the money for the end use so today government gives lot of subsidies grants right and we keep reading in newspapers that it has not reached last mile or it is misused and you know but what if we program that you know subsidy what we already program that grant if i give a 1000 rupee to a farmer to buy fertilizer how do i ensure that he will buy fertilizer only so i will issue that 1000 rupee to a farmer which can be encased only to buy fertilizers that money has no other use that money will work only at fertilizer shops that's the only end use right so lot of you know stuff can be built you know using the cbdc framework and it also ensure that where many people feel that you know uh, i i will keep cash at my home right because i feel it is secured it is with me i can see my money you know and if i keep it let's say in how to kept it in banks like let's say silicon valley bank right or any other bank in us i don't know what will happen to my money but if i have a 100 rupee note lying with me you know i i am i am convinced and i am comfortable that oh this money nobody can take so cbdc is a digital money it's like your 100 rupee note only you know today when you deposit that money with the bank the money doesn't belong to the bank it's your money and it will open up lot of use cases you know as we move forward but this will bring in a different kind of revolution in terms of managing your money now i'll come to the last use case you know i'm um, there are many more we can discuss but with a we have limited time so you know metaverse metaverse is like a combination of you know tech of combination of technologies like ar vr and dlt and blockchain right how do we it's a word it's a word meta means you know it's a greek word it means you know beyond or transcend so it will change entirely the way we communicate we engage today when i open up a mobile app you know and i do my transaction on my mobile app it's a two way communication it's 2d right where there is no personal interaction with any bank officer 
I am doing my transaction on my mobile app. Now imagine, you know, that you actually sitting at your home, you are in the branch, you know, you are an environment of a branch talking to you, your branch manager, right? So that's the kind of way it will change the way we do banking, way we interact, you know, it would give you an experience of 3D and not 2D, right? Where the communication layer will be very different. So you can actually provide comfort to your, you know, customers that, hey, sitting at your home, just putting a VR glass, you can be in a branch, communicate with any of our branch managers, you know, as if you are in real world communicating to our branch managers. Similarly, people, you know, when they buy properties, they have to look around for many options and then they decide. It's a very cumbersome process. Instead of that, again, people sitting at their home can visit multiple properties, you know, and decide which one to buy and then probably go and visit, you know. And then training. It can be widely used, you know, for training your employees, you know, virtual training. Uh, so there are lot, many more use cases and it will keep evolving as we move forward, right? So I tried to cover a couple of, you know, use cases which are more prevalent and which are kind of seeing, you know, commercial applications. But apart from that, there are, you know, a lot of use cases which will keep evolving as we kind of, you know, start using DLT as more and more mainstream, you know, kind of technology. So with this, probably I will, you know, keep some time for, you know, Q&A as well. Uh, you know, happy to answer any questions, you know. I think gentleman at the back can provide the mic there. Oh, you can ask. Yeah, yeah. So, see, today, you know, when you do a you know, LC, you know, bank is a trust provider in between. So one bank, you know, provides a letter of credit to the another bank stating that if this, you know, buyer will not pay for the goods, we will pay for the goods as a bank. So here the, with the platform, the trust layer is enhanced, you know, where bank still provides the trust, but the transaction or the communication, you know, is handled in a manner where everybody is able to see it. Today, you know, if I'm a buyer, there is a seller, buyer's bank, seller's bank, they're all on different, different, you know, kind of platforms. Nobody has a single view of the entire transaction. So here, if we bring them all on the same platform, the layer of, you know, kind of trust kind of further increases. And then there is a audit trail available, you know. So if, let's say, if there is a miscommunication or any mistake or any documents are not, you know, kind of handled in a, in a proper manner, you always an audit trail, right? So this again enhances the trust. So platform does the job of enhancing the trust, you know. I hope it answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can ask, I think Mike is not there, so. And what is the timeline you see from a future perspective where the blockchain can move more from even corporate to the retail kind of uh, uh, solutions? Yeah. So I think there are, you know, a couple of use cases which banks are already, you know, kind of implementing or are have implemented. So one of the use cases, right, your treasury liquidity pool management amongst your subsidiaries, right? So let's say as a bank you have, you know, 10, 20 subsidiaries or 10, 20 branches outside India. 
now you all you all of all the you know the respective branches needs to manage a certain liquidity pool correct now ours 12 what used to happen was that there used to be a disaggregated liquidity pool maintained at every branch right instead of that if you create a common payment hub and you maintain central liquidity right your requirement to maintain you know liquidity in different different currencies actually go down so that is one use case which is kind of being widely this thing kind of implemented second you know the uh, the lc use case you know a lot of banks are doing it individually and you know part of the consortium also these are the two and the third is cbdc which is kind of you know which has got implemented now and which you know we are seeing some traction right i mean so these are the three use cases which are already kind of at different different levels of implementation yeah somebody there yeah mic denge wahan pe aap you have also mentioned and we have seen certain use cases of dlt uh, blockchain and some of them were uh, government supported initiatives also like sld and ulip and of course cbdc was one among them as well would Uh, and some cross border uh, dlt based uh, applications like bolero and also have been there in the market yeah. still would want to understand with respect to ibbic's way of working in what form and fashion ibbic is collaborating with uh, indian stakeholders as well as cross border stakeholders in terms of bringing the uh, subsequent innovative use cases in the uh, dlt domain yeah so you know ibbic we have started with the first use case which is the trade finance you know and it, the trade finance itself is very huge you know opportunity right so what we have done is that ibbi says that we have got all the member banks we have 18 banks which are you know the founding member banks we have got all the member banks you know created a common platform with inputs from all the banks and we are plugging in all these banks into this single platform so this is the first use case where the entire trade finance would be digitized and ibbic will become a kind of a central uh, you know uh, uh, a kind of entity to manage all the communication right today what swift does swift does you know the communication part of it right ibbic would be communication plus plus it would be a network it would be a messaging platform and it will also provide a lot of analytics on top of it okay so that's the vision for ibbic trade finance is one use case we are looking at lot of other use cases in ibbic right so uh, but obviously we will begin with you know the trade finance because you know it, it itself is a very mammoth and very huge so first use case is ib you know in, in ibbic is trade finance as we move forward we have planned uh, we will do you know uh, you know invoice financing on the platform but in a different today let's say the problem is that if you discount an invoice you don't know whether this invoice is discounted with other banks or not you want to do authentication of that right so that is another use case which you are building there third use case is at some point in time we'll also build you know digital lending you know because we feel that there is lot of scope there when i when i talked about the you know uh, tier 3 tier 4 msme financing right that is another use case which you are kind of thinking of building but we don't want to rush into everything we'll take one at a time because you know anything you take up we should actually thoroughly you know implement it and reap the benefits and rather than getting distracted into multiple things you know so that's the plan and object, you know kind of as of now and we have kind of we got the team now to manage this entire you know operations of ibbic and um, i think we're getting support from all the banks so so working in right direction not yet it's a you know built by ib the platform is built by ibbic but yeah we have kind of had several dialogues with the you know iba you know regulator so all those things we are doing times up you know any other question last question so oh, hope we have time or just one last quick or we question. can take it offline yeah last question yeah sure. so there are
are these immense use cases mm -hmm. that you spoke about around DLT, but uh, the other side of it is the adoption to it, right? So what do you see are the biggest challenges that are sort of restricting the adoption of DLT uh, at, a, at a process level maybe across the organization? And how to overcome some of those challenges? Maybe? No, fantastic question. Very good question. See, today, if you see that, let's say UPI kind of, right? The way it works and the number of volume and number of transactions, right? So per second, you hit multiple transactions, right? DLT had that limitation in terms of how many transactions you can process because, you know, it's every time you create a hash, you create a blog, you know, it takes its own time. But what people have done is that they are layer one protocols, right? For example, Ethereum is a layer one protocol. Polygon, what they've done is they've kind of created a fork out of it, removed all the limitations of Ethereum in terms of the you know, the transaction processing and other limitations, and have created, you know, a, a layer on top of it, which is layer two, which again, you know, kind of facilitates, you know, the speed, large volumes of transactions, right? So, I think one, you know, is the uh, people kind of thought about that it may not be able to handle large amount of transactions and at a speed, which in a way it is getting addressed. That was one limitation. Second is the you know, knowledge about, you know, DLT, right? Many of the banks or institutions are still not, you know, kind of up the cow when it comes to kind of DLT. And third is it requires, you know, many more stakeholders. When you implement DLT, it's not about, you know, bilateral, you know. So when you get all the stakeholders together, it is very difficult to align stakeholders. And it takes time. Like for example, IBBIC, we got 18 banks. Can you imagine talk, two different departments in the bank don't talk to each other? Getting 18 banks in one room and making, you know, agreeing them to do something together, it's a Herculean task, right? I mean, so it takes time. So I think it's also a matter of alignment also, right? So these are some of the limitations, but I think over a period of time, we see that once people start seeing the benefits, you know, that alignment will automatically start, you know, kind of happening. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you have been all been awesome audience, you know. Thank you. I'm available for any offline questions as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I think yeah. let's thank him for the, such a valuable guidance. Can we have a huge round of applause? And I'm sure most of the answer questions were also answered. Now I shall thank request you. Ms. Divyani Chobal to please come on stage to felicitate our teacher, Hitesh Sajdev. Can we have Divyani Chobal, Senior Director, you next? Thank you.